Okay. This is uh, Prasanna Kumariyam, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, MJ College. I uh, wholeheartedly welcome you all to the uh, six days webinar series, and this is the third day of the webinar series. Um, now I request uh, Professor Sumitra, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Agatha Manmal Jain College, uh, to propose the welcome address. Uh, over to you, Sumitra. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Warm greeting to everyone present here. On behalf of August and Man Moon Jain College, I proudly welcome you all to the ICPR Periodical Lecture Series 2021. Due to the pandemic situation, we are organizing the lecture in online platform. With a great honor and pleasure, I would like to welcome the chief guests of today's event, Dr. S. Pani Selvam, former professor, head, Department of Philosophy, University of Madras, Chennai. He will be delivering the lecture titled on Recent Indian Philosophers and Introduction. Dear sir, we wholeheartedly welcome you to the program. With great pleasure, we delighted welcome our another chief guest, Dr. P. Unnikishnan, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, Kerala. He will be delivering the lecture titled on A Relook at the Classification of Indian Philosophy. Philosophy. Dear sir, we wholeheartedly welcome you to the program. I glad to welcome our secretary, Shanti Mullar and management members. I warmly and respectfully welcome our principal, Dr. Venkata Ramanan, who has been pillar behind this program. My genial welcome to our vice principal, Dr. B. Mahavi. I feel happy to welcome Dr. S. Manikandan, head department of philosophy, who has been the backbone of this program. I wholeheartedly welcome Head Department of History, Dr. Anathakishnan. We pleasely welcome our Amita Valmiki ma'am, Dr. Badrina sir, Krishna Kumar Vyas. Once again, we welcome you all. Thank you. I extend my welcome to all the heads of department who are gathered here. Add radiance to occasion. I am happy to welcome Office Superintendent, Office Superintendent Mr. Ravi Chandran and non-teaching staff members. I also welcome all the participant research scholars from different parts of the country. I welcome our students' philosophy, AM Jain College. I hope the program will be great and successful. Once again, welcome you. Uh, thank, thank you, Sumitra, for your wonderful words. And now I request our loud HOD, Dr. S. Manikandan, to introduce uh, the speaker of the day, first speaker of the day, Dr. S. Paneesal. Thank you, Prasanna, and thank you, Sumitra. Uh, I warmly welcome all. Adi Shankar's birth anniversary we are celebrating. Almost uh, we have crossed the, off the bridge today. Today is the third day, uh, and uh, Panisar will vouch me. So it's an excellent task uh, to gather and organize a program like this. And uh, with your blessings, and with the blessings of all the teachers, and uh, senior faculty members, we have been doing this program. Uh, before I uh, introduce, introduce the chief guest of today, I want to just briefly say something about our department. The Department of Philosophy was established in a way back in 18, 1982, sir. Almost we are uh, nearing four decades, 39 years uh, past. So far, in, uh, no, none of the students have turned, us, turned to us and said that, you know, because of philosophy, we failed in life. Life is due to philosophy, they shine more than any other uh, discipline of the knowledge. And that is the main thing. And uh, we offer only undergraduate courses. And we have the highest strength in the departments. Uh, we have 210 students pursuing BA philosophy in our uh, college. And uh, so far, whatever the grant uh, the ICPR has been announcing, we have been able to make use of it. Uh, so far, we have conducted uh, six periodical lectures, almost six years we have been continuously doing this. This is the first time we are doing a uh, Indian Philosophers Day celebration in our college. So we are inducted to ICPR and uh, faculty members who are gathered here with your blessings and wishes we have been doing this. And uh, hope you continue to bless us in coming years also, sir. And we were fortunate enough even to have a book grant. Uh, the ICPR has given us more than 230 30 books, which we have sacked in our library for the use of faculties and as well as for the students. 
and uh, now i am my duty is to introduce pani uh, sadan sir no he, the man who doesn't need any introduction at all no the just sp is enough so that no right from jammu kashmir to kanyakumari no in uh, rajasthan to till west bengal everyone knows him. uh he is a gateway of our india our gateway of south india he is almost uh, no south indian socrates i am uh, profoundly overjoyed to take an opportunity to introduce our chief guest of the day we have a uh, two speakers today today we have a great scholars stalwarts charismatic professors with us the first we have the professor none other than uh, s panni selvam sir former professor head of the department department of philosophy university of madras uh, he, uh, his lecture is today is on a uh, recent indian philosophers on an uh, introduction the second speaker of the day is uh, dr p unni krishnan assistant professor department of philosophy sri shankaracharya university sanskrit kalari kerala his topic of a day is a uh, uh, relook at the classification of the indian philosophy now uh, the brief uh, summary of uh, pani selvam sir he is very popular that everyone in philosophical arena will know him uh, that you uh, know we can vouch you uh, uh, know since uh, valmiki madam have joined and uh, no krishna kumar vyas sir has joined just his name is uh, no miracle that will pull he has an a magnetic uh, power you know every scholars will be interested to listen to him that is his um, no the scholar uh, i can say uh, he is a national fellow of icpr the very rare honor which has been bestowed to sir and he is a general secretary of indian philosophical congress he is a member of council in uh, indian philosophical research and he is a president of uh, chennai philosophical forum and he is a founder member of uh, chennai philosophical forum uh, we have to salute sir for that for his continuously organizing every month one philosophical lecture great sir we salute you for that sir thank you and uh, publication we don't you uh, know i can't uh, uh, you know count the how many publication he has he has the publications in almost all national and international journals and he has lot of books in the, and he is in a, right now an editor for so many journals and he has visited the entire uh, continent i can say almost seven continent he might have visited i don't know how many passports he has <laughs> and uh, i believe sir uh, you know our spend with you is better than a lifetime of an ignorance that i really mean so my dear students and the scholars who have gathered here please lend your ears definitely you no know, it will be a more useful for coming years and the days as a, a wise man will make more opportunity than he finds i repeat the francis bacon saying francis bacon the wise man will make a more opportunity than he finds so we are made in an opportunity here uh, we have a great stalwart professor s panisalup sir with us let us you know tune to him now over to you sir thank you sir thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. most uh, revered and uh, respected uh, principal of this college uh, my good friend uh, professor manikandan uh, professor uh, prasanna professor smitra the three murtis who have been playing a very important role in imparting the knowledge of philosophy to all of us in fact uh, the department uh, has been contributing substantially for the progress of uh, philosophy and we are all grateful to the college and especially this uh, uh, thank you sir of the faculty who, who is doing an excellent service uh, and i am happy to see uh, our senior uh, colleague uh, mr uh, krishna kumar vyas ji and my good friend uh, uh, professor murli is there professor anand krishnan i am able to see amita ji uh, badri and many others are there and uh, i think principal also joined sir principal also joined thank you sir for joining 
uh, Professor Unikishan and the other colleagues uh, and student friends. Uh, at the outset, I am grateful to the college for uh, Shiva from uh, uh, Malaysia has joined. Uh, first of all, I take this opportunity to thank, to thank the college for uh, uh, asking me to deliver a talk on recent Indian philosophers. Just I'll note down the time because I forget the time when I talk. That's a big problem. So, <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do is to discuss uh, very briefly with you the contributions of uh, recent Indian philosophers. Some of you must be wondering why I am using the term recent Indian philosophy or recent Indian philosophers. Of course, if you look at the uh, Western philosophical tradition, we have three important periods. First is uh, the Greek period. Second is the modern period. Of course, in between we have the medieval period. And uh, after modern period, we have a uh, contemporary Western philosophy, where important movements have emerged in the West. But in the West also, we proceed from continental, uh, sorry, uh, uh, contemporary Western philosophy to what is known as recent Western philosophy. By recent Western philosophy, we mean some of the very important schools which have emerged uh, recently in the West. For example, hermeneutics, uh, phenomenology. Phenomenology, of course, is a contemporary movement, but uh, there are many interpretations of uh, uh, contemporary, uh, sorry, uh, uh, phenomenology. So I would uh, put it under recent uh, Western philosophy. Then uh, we have modernism, uh, sorry, postmodernism, then um, uh, post-structuralism, post-postmodernism, and it goes on. So I thought uh, the similar approach could be made from Indian side also. Because uh, while discussing Indian philosophy, we start with the uh, classical Indian philosophy where uh, the Asika and Nasika schools are discussed. Then we go to contemporary Indian philosophy. But I would like to make a, a distinction between contemporary Indian philosophy and recent Indian philosophy or philosophers. I have a feeling that uh, the contemporary philosophers have dealt uh, with issues uh, concerning man and his relation to society. In fact, I would say this is a distinctive mark of contemporary philosophy. What is that? They have dealt with uh, the practical problems of man. Two factors are important here. The first one is the contemporary thinkers have understood the need for reinterpreting Indian philosophy. This means that the traditional concepts of Indian philosophy like moksha or dharma or karma were interpreted from a new perspective, taking or placing man as the center of philosophy. The other important fact is that Due to the political environment prevailed during this period, philosophers became freedom fighters. So these two aspects must be taken into account while discussing contemporary Indian philosophy. So the first uh, important factor which I said was that uh, they were reinterpreting Indian philosophy. This made many of uh, the critiques to make a remark that there is nothing new in a contemporary Indian philosophy. Because they were not able to uh, give some new systems like classical Indian philosophy. In fact, there are critics who argue that in the contemporary Indian philosophy, we have not made significant progress. 
of course this criticism is wrong because we have made sufficient or uh, enough uh, progress uh, in contemporary indian philosophy what is important is that we have given a new methodology for understanding indian philosophy this i would call reinterpreting indian philosophy this is how we discuss uh, contemporary indian philosophy where we place thinkers like uh, tilak tagore swami vivekananda gandhi sri arabindo kesi bhattacharya ramana magarishi radha krishnan pt rajiv iqbal jude krishnamurthy and many others what is important is that all the contemporary philosophers are concerned about the practical uh, or the application of a uh, philosophy which means for them man is a center or human being is a center this is very much reflected in the writings of uh, swami vivekananda that's why he said i do not believe in a religion which cannot wipe out uh, the tears of a widow or which cannot bring a loaf of bread to an orphan's mouth in fact uh, he said that the poor people are daridra narayana so as a practical vedantin swami vivekananda could see the sufferings of human beings and many of the contemporary thinkers uh, can be placed in this group all of them were concerned about human being but in the classical indian philosophy i would say we were more concerned about the concept of self or jiva or soul so i feel that in the contemporary indian philosophy we are concerned about uh, man as such man as a human being so the self is important but in in addition to self <coughs> they were also concentrating on a human body so this was uh, the main focus of uh, the contemporary indian philosophy now what do i mean by the term recent indian philosophy of course the contemporary indian philosophy and uh, recent indian philosophy they are overlapping but in spite of that i feel that one can make a distinction i would like to make a distinction like this in recent indian philosophy or in recent indian philosophers we see the interpretation or reinterpretation of indian philosophy like contemporary indian philosophy but what they did was the many of many of uh, the recent indian philosophers what they did was they try to apply some of the western models which are available to them and they apply this western model to indian philosophical discourse as a result of which they could show the beauty or the value of indian philosophy most of them excepting one or two they were trained both in indian and western philosophy so they were able to take a the uh, tools uh, which are available to them and they were applying this tool to indian philosophical tradition so that a new way of looking at indian philosophy uh, could emerge and second uh, important distinction between contemporary and uh, west uh, uh, recent indian philosophy is that what do i mean by recent i mean the philosophers who are with us or who have passed away very recently this is very important for the main reason that uh, in philosophical uh, discourse we are neglecting the contributions uh, which are made by our own thinkers of course we are fond of uh, reading western philosophical tradition no doubt it is important but it is high time for us to understand the great contribution made by our own thinkers who have left us recently 
or who are with us and contributing substantially for the progress of philosophy. The purpose of my lecture is to uh, impress upon you that uh, it is high time for us to include uh, these recent Indian philosophers in our syllabus so that one can understand the contribution, the significant contribution made by them. So many recent philosophers, Indian philosophers or philosophers in India, there is a distinction once again, Indian philosophers and philosophers in India. So many recent uh, Indian philosophers have shown the need and the method to evolve a truly modern way of doing philosophy. So this doing philosophy is something very important. And the recent Indian philosophers have shown the direction of uh, doing philosophy. And these philosophers who talk about, uh, who talk about uh, establishing a creative philosophical tradition in India with the, the notion of tradition, because for most of them, tradition has been playing a very important role, positively or negatively. Some of them have critiqued the notion of tradition. So they were able to formulate uh, some new problems which could be seen in the light of uh, uh, in the light of uh, uh, the existing Western philosophy, and they could see how Indian philosophy can give some new insights if we apply the methodology or the tools which are available to us. So I am picking up the tools from the West and applying it to Indian tradition. That was the the main aim of uh, the, the recent Indian philosophers. So they could show some new way of looking at Indian philosophy. And uh, I can give some, some uh, thinkers who made a tremendous impact. For example, Subhijivan Bhattacharya. Some of you must be knowing uh, this great uh, philosopher, Subhijivan Bhattacharya, of course, who is no more, who is well versed in uh, Navinyaya. So what he did was he used the mathematical logic because he was very much familiar with mathematical logic. So he applied the mathematical logic to Navinyaya. This is a new contribution. And similarly, we have a thinker, B.K. Matilal, who has used uh, the analytical philosophy to understand the Nyaya realism. And similarly, J.N. Mohanty has applied the Husserlian phenomenology to understand Indian philosophical problems. And Ganeshwar Mishra, he was a great uh, professor in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Utkal University, late Professor G uh, Ganeshwar Mishra. And he used uh, the linguistic and analytical method to interpret Advaita Vedanta. And of course, all of us are familiar with uh, the name R. Balasubramaniam, who is affectionately known as R.B., who has used the phenomenological model and uh, the existential model in order to uh, uh, understand or reinterpret Advaita um, uh, uh, method. So all these thinkers have given a creative methodology for understanding Indian philosophy. Now, what is the benefit, you must ask? Why should, why should I use uh, the Western methodology? By using Western methodology, one can show a new direction for, for the future of Indian philosophy. Because uh, all these methods, the Western, so-called Western methods like phenomenological or uh, even the postmodern, uh, uh, hermeneutical, all these linguistic, all these methods, analytical, all these methods are very much available in Indian philosophical tradition. So all these recent Indian philosophers have shown how we can reinterpret Indian philosophy from the Western philosophical discourse. So taking into consideration the approaches which are available to us, I would like to make uh, this analysis. What is that? Basically, we can say that there are two models which are available to us. 
one is the reductionistic model the reductionistic model is a term which was used by uh, professor gc nayak from uh, utkal university so i am using the term the reductionistic model and there are reasons for using the term reductionistic model i'll explain that in few minutes so the reductionistic model is one methodology one method one model and another is uh, the comparative analytical method now the first one that is reductionistic model was adopted by ganeshwar mishra whom i mentioned just now what did he do he was a oxford trained uh, uh, philosopher so after coming from oxford he has used because he was very much familiar with the analytical method of the west so what he did was he applied the western uh, western analytic philosophy to shankara in order to show that shankara was a linguistic philosopher or in shankara's advaita vedanta you can see the role of uh, analytic philosophy or philosophy of language this is something remarkable because for the first time in the history of indian philosophy one indian philosopher is able to show that uh, shankara is an analytical thinker or a philosopher of language so what he did was he could successfully show that the meta we have been looking at shankara only from the metaphysical side so here is a thinker who could boldly argue that there is another way of uh, looking at shankara in fact he says uh, that the concept of uh, uh, adhyasa preaches according to him the philosophy of language and not uh, the illusory character of the world of course he gives a uh, arguments and one of the arguments i would like to point out here he says metaphysics even in the days of shankara was openly and avowedly concerned with linguistic and logical analysis the analysis of logical concepts or mapping out the conceptual conceptual framework and nothing else so he has written very important books if uh, our young scholars could read this book uh, they will have a different perspective of uh, uh, indian philosophy is two books uh, are one the analytical studies in indian philosophy and second one is uh, advaita the method and limits so he is able to look at shankara from the western tradition and uh, in this model he tries uh, to give enough argument to prove that indian tradition also contains in it uh, the analytical method so the analytical method is not something new to us because in the western tradition all of us know this has emerged as a very important movement only in the 19th and 20th century to start with the uh, uh, russell wittgenstein and others but here Ganesh Mishra is able to show successfully that the analytical method is very much present in Shankara. But of course, there are criticisms, no doubt. For example, G. C. Nayak, whom I mentioned just now, he argued that this is a reductionistic model because reducing reducing Shankara as a, a linguistic philosophy. this uh, he said uh, one cannot accept of course there are certain uh, difficulties but what i am trying to say is that here is a methodology or here is a model which could show us a new way of looking at shankara right then another thinker whom uh, i would like to mention here because initially i said there are two models remember one is the the, the reductionistic model and the other is the comparative analytic model and uh, b k matilal belongs to this uh, school uh, who was very much uh, familiar with all indian systems of uh, indian philosophy
So what he did was he has used once again the analysis and a comparative method. A comparative method. So his method I would like to call comparative analytic model. Because uh, this could uh, uh, be seen in some of his writings. For example, he has written uh, books like uh, Logic, uh, Language and uh, Reality. Then Analytical Philosophy in Comparative Perspective. The Word and the World and Perception. These are some of his books uh, uh, written by B.K. Matilal. And uh, especially in all these books, especially in the book uh, Perception, one could see that how he has been comparing Indian and Western philosophical tradition. So according to him, what we call the philosophy of language in India has always formed a part of a classical philosophical epistemological inquiry. So what uh, he tried to show is that in uh, epistemological understanding of Indian philosophy, one can see the philosophy of language. So this is something new because uh, the philosophy of language, which has become a very important discipline in the West, uh, is seen from a new perspective using the methods which are available and we relook re uh, our own tradition in order to show that uh, Indian philosophy of language is uh, not uh, something new. So the question he has raised is this. How does a linguistic utterance through the communicative, through communication of its meaning impart the knowledge to the hearer? Uh, his method of understanding uh, philosophy of language in India is uh, something very important. Because he says, by analyzing <coughs> the sentences and words and their components, and by studying the relation that exists between word and meaning, we can see how our ancient Indian philosophers have been developing what is known as a Indian philosophy of language. So some of the principles which are discussed in the West are already available in the classical Indian philosophy. Now, B.K. Matilal says there is one uh, advantage in using this comparative analytical model. He says that there are two advantages. One is, the first one is, it is it has not reduced everything to analysis and hence the fallacy of reductionism is avoided because now this method which is otherwise known as the analytic as well as comparative method has not simply reduced everything to mere analysis. It shows that uh, there is another way of looking at uh, Indian philosophy. And the second important principle which he has uh, formulated is that this method allows us to think and apply Western methodology to Indian philosophical problems to ponder over the question why very similar puzzles uh, evolve different responses from different people. This is very important. If you, if you observe this uh, uh, sentence, it conveys a lot of meaning. He says philosophical problems are one and the same throughout the world. But uh, the same problems can give different answers. That is the reason why we are able to see <coughs> Our methodology, that means uh, Indian methodology, could look at uh, the Western philosophy from a different perspective and it could uh, see something which is lacking in the uh, Western philosophical discourse. So though the philosophical problems are one and the same throughout uh, uh, the globe, Indian philosophers have given different solutions because there is uh, the cultural difference, the way of understanding the concepts. So all these paved a way for a new understanding of uh, philosophical problems. So the recent Indian philosophers have made a substantial contribution in their field of research. 
so their approach to philosophical problems are not only novel but also problem oriented this is very important all recent indian philosophers are concerned about uh, uh, the problem oriented issues here it must be admitted that these philosophers are very much uh, influenced by the western uh, thought but they were not satisfied with the western model in fact uh, they could successfully show the defects in the western model though it is uh, not possible to mention uh, all the names of thinkers recent indian philosophers who have used this methodology i can mention some of them here i would like to show uh, three important uh, types of uh, philosophy that uh, uh, the recent indian philosophers are doing the first one is uh, the pure advaitic model the second is the analytic phenomenological model the third is the critical socio political model and the fourth is the inclusive model so i would like to place all uh, recent indian philosophers in this group in this four categories or in this four types now the pure advaitic model is a model which is used by some of our recent thinkers in order to show that in advaita you can see all the methods which are available in the west of course uh, one thinker uh, is dr radhakrishnan because radhakrishnan as an idealist uh, and he is also an advaitin but i am not going to discuss uh, radhakrishnan because i would always place him in contemporary indian philosophy uh, but one thinker whom i would like to discuss under this group namely pure advaitic model is uh, professor t m p mahadevan who lived between 1911 to 1983 he is a great exponent of advaita vedanta in fact it is said that in academic circle mahadevan and advaita are synonyms and he is a practical advaitin by training as well as temperament mahadevan in other words was an embodiment of advaita vedanta he himself writes about his commitment to advaita as follows i quote him advaita to the exposition of which uh, i have dedicated my entire life he is not a school of philosophy nor can it be limited by what we nowadays call philosophy advaita he says is a symbolic name for the principle of duality i quote unquote so it is very clear from this uh, one can see that uh, mahadevan identified anything and everything with advaita he wrote uh, more than 50 books and published number of articles some of them are very important wherein his uh, methodology of advaita is very much visible uh, like uh, we can see this in the book of uh, critic of uh, difference uh, this book actually he did uh, along with uh, professor s surinarayan sastri in the year 1936 and later uh, he wrote uh, outlines of hinduism the spirit of indian philosophy 10 saints of india invitations to indian philosophy ramana magarishi a philosopher looks back or some of his important books but in all these books you can see an excellent exposition of advaita vedanta which he was doing throughout his life that's why i said uh, in the beginning itself that this is a pure advaitic model but there were criticisms commenting on this uh, one of the living giant, giants of philosophy legends of philosophy professor uh, rajendra prasad he says i quote him glorifying merely interpretive studies of advaita vedanta are found in the various writings of uh, tm p mahadev this is a uh the criticism of rajendra prasad ji on mahadev i repeat glorifying merely interpretative studies of advaita vedanta are found in the writings of mahadevan further he says 
his traditionalism or dogmatism born out of his adherence to s t conception s capital t concept t capital s t concept is clearly visible in his declaration which he has made and quote now first of all let me explain what is uh, this s t conception according to rajendra prasad according to rajendra prasad he says uh, indian philosophy is dominated by what is known as the spiritualistic and transcendental concept yes t you can see the spiritualistic as well as transcendental conception of philosophy in fact in fact he says rajendra prasad ji says uh, that indian philosophy is constructed in such a way that uh, this estic conception is operating all the time in indian philosophy of course there are thinkers like daya krishna and others who uh, uh, also say that uh, uh, that the spiritualistic uh, approach of indian philosophy uh, is not correct so uh rajendra prasad uh, is vehemently criticizing the methodology which is adopted by uh, tmi mahadevan in his uh, pure advaitic model and rajendra prasad further says that such a tradition of committed advaitism would weaker the tradition of uh, historical scholarship because you know here this this is a very very significant uh, point which uh, prasad ji has made because he's a he's a very very uh, important thinker uh, who who is always uh, uh, making some uh, important contribution to philosophy uh, is analytical philosopher and his last statement is something very important such a tradition of committed atheism would weaker the tradition so what does this mean this means you no know, though some of us uh, uh, some of the philosophers like uh, tmb mahadevan were uh, uh endorsing the role of tradition of course tradition is important but uh, such uh, an attempt uh, uh would uh, weaken the tradition instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, strengthening the tradition such methods would naturally weaken the tradition so the problem with uh, mahadevan's approach is that uh, he saw advaita everywhere for him contemporary thinkers like tagore gandhi sri arabindo were also advaitins so and also as one who is well trained in uh, pre shankara post shankara and contemporary advaita mahadevan always tried to understand other systems and other thinkers in terms of uh, advaita background so he felt uh, that advaita is not a system of thought and it is not an ism but he says it is a, a way of life and further he said it does not a uh, conflict with the uh, other system so this uh, method this uh, type of philosophy which uh, i would call pure uh, advaitic method uh, is useful but it has got some limitation then the second uh, type of philosophy which is available among the recent thinkers is uh, the analytic uh, the and uh, the phenomenological method here i would uh, uh, briefly mention uh, the phenomenological method which is uh, available in western tradition in western as well as indian tradition. remember in the beginning of my talk i said uh, i made a distinction between philosophers in india and indian philosophers now indian philosophers are those who wrote on indian philosophical issues by using sometimes they use uh, the western methodology but uh, all of them cannot be clubbed under philosophers of india because some of the philosophers whom i am going to mention like r sundar rajan they were writing western philosophy only but they could show that how the western method of doing philosophy is very much very much important in indian context and a person like sundarajan who was always uh, fond of writing on western philosophy towards the end of his life uh, he was uh, very much influenced by indian philosophy and he started writing on uh, purusharthas for example because there was a debate uh, during that time whether 
purushartha especially moksha whether it is immanent or transcendent thinkers like daya krishna rajendra prasad uh, k j shah uh, uh, then sundarajan all of them wrote uh, on purushartha so what i'm trying to say is professor sundarajan who lived uh, during 1935 to 1997 wrote on phenomenology but uh, there are some insights which are very much available in this in his phenomenological method and many uh, thinkers they use this phenomenological methodology which he has adopted to indian philosophical tradition so the method which uh, r sundarajan who was actually a south indian a tamilian who settled in pune university made a substantial contribution among the recent indian philosophers and uh, uh, some of his books i would like to mention here the first book which he wrote in 1974 is the structure and change in philosophy which talks about philosophy of science then he wrote on new studies in marxism studies in phenomenology etc then towards a critique of cultural uh, reason this is a trilogy that is first one is innovative competence and social change then secondly towards a critic of cultural reason and third on the primary of the political and later he wrote uh, books like transformations of uh, transcendental philosophy humanization of transcendental philosophy etc and the posthumous work uh, the crisis of uh, european science and the transcendental pheno uh, phenomenology is something very much important because here he tells us how to look at a uh, science in fact he gives a uh, four methodologies for understanding science for what of time i am not uh, discussing that uh, he has shown the interconnections uh, and interdependence between language and politics by discussing the political dimension of language uh, in his writings we can see the significance of uh, uh, paul ricoeur or derrida or habermas in the context of uh, philosophy so if we apply this methodology to indian philosophical tradition one can enrich a indian philosophical uh, tradition and also he is a person who talks about uh, geophilia uh, because he is the one who supported he talks about three turns uh, in philosophy one is uh, the linguistic turn and the second turn according to him is uh, the feminist turn and the third turn is the ecological turn so some of the turns uh, are really uh, helping us in order to understand uh, uh, the problems uh, which are facing uh, in uh, philosophy as well as uh, uh, in the in, in the field of uh, environment uh, and other disciplines so the methodology uh, which uh, sundarajan has given is purely a western methodology so i would uh, say it is a phenomenological method but uh, if we apply this method then perhaps uh, uh, we can get uh, some new insights uh, in indian philosophy and uh, the third method or uh, third type of philosophy the first one please remember it is a pure and a pure advaitic model represented by tp mahadevan and the second model is uh, the, uh, the 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 phenomenological uh, model adopted by r sundarajan uh, who wrote on western philosophy but some of the insights are very important to apply it to indian tradition uh, and the third uh, methodology or third type of philosophy uh, which is very fascinating is uh, the critical and socio political model of course here uh, i have placed uh, professor uh, daya krishna uh, and uh, uh, dev prasad uh, chatobadhyay of course uh, some time back we have discussed uh, uh, professor uh, daya krishna in detail especially when uh, the same uh, college uh, am jain college organized a program uh, i gave a detailed uh, talk on uh, daya krishna and uh, jain mohanty so i am not going to discuss uh, them here because uh, though they are recent philosopher since we have uh, discussed them in detail i would like to go to another important thinker so this comes under the critical and socio political model or type and the thinker uh, whom i would like to discuss is dp chatobadhyay uh, 
uh, actually in uh, philosophical discourse uh, we come across uh, two chattopadhyaya one is uh, uh, i mean uh, affectionately known as uh, senior chattopadhyaya who wrote on uh, lokayata and a book like the books like what is living and dead in indian philosophy etc it's a marxist is a very great thinker very influential thinker he gave a new uh, philosophical dimension to uh, indian philosophy he has uh, told us how to read indian philosophy so uh, all our uh, young scholars must read uh, the writings of uh, uh, devi prasad chatobadhyaya the marxist thinker then the other thinker whom i am going to mention here is uh, devi prasad chatobadhyaya chatobadhyaya otherwise known as uh, dp chatobadhyaya uh, who was born in the year uh, 1933 is a living philosopher uh, he is uh, affectionately known as uh, junior chatobadhyaya to make a distinction between these uh, two great uh, chatobadhyayas who have made uh, a significant contribution so who is uh, dp chatobadhyaya he is a well known philosopher who has got uh, international reputation he has written extensively in the form of books and articles some of his uh, publications i would like to quote here the individuals and society uh, then societies and culture the individual and the world history science and polity form aesthetic experience and beautiful in bengali environment uh, evolution and values knowledge freedom and language anthropology and uh, historiographical science interdisciplinary studies in science technology philosophy culture etc then phenomenology this is a very important book phenomenology and indian philosophy which is a edited volume and uh, social and political philosophy these are some of his uh, important writing but what is uh, significant is that uh, he has uh, uh, established p h i s p that is uh, uh, it is known as fisp philosophy project he has started a very big project project of history indian science uh, 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 and values p h i s p wherein he could uh, uh, bring out uh, 100 volumes this is a very very important volumes on various uh, traditions of uh, indian and western philosophy indian culture values ethics uh, all these uh, disciplines were uh, uh, taken very seriously by the scholars and he has asked them to uh, edit some volumes and nearly more than 100 volumes have uh, come out uh, and even in tamil uh, he has asked myself and my teacher uh, uh, great professor rb to edit uh, two volumes on in uh, tamil tradition so which is uh, titled as uh, life world of the tamils Uh, two volumes each volume running into 900 pages so he has uh, uh, given us uh, a chance to understand our culture value uh, ethics uh, art architecture everything so his contribution is something remarkable and uh, he is uh, concerned uh, is for uh, the progress of man uh, he has developed a philosophy uh, Varin, he talks about uh, the significance of uh, human beings. So here, I would like to point out very briefly. I don't know uh, my time. Ten uh, fifteen. So uh, he talks about uh, one book. I would like to mention here. Uh, the title of the book is "Individuals and Worlds: Essays in Anthropological Rationalism." This is a very important book because he talks about uh, the concept of man in detail. now remember in the beginning i said uh, the recent indian philosophers of course contemporary indian philosophers also they were concerned about uh, man as such uh, they are not concerned about soul or self they are directly concerned about uh, the practical side of human being so in this book uh, he deals with the idea that uh, whatever results from human endeavor are subject to human limitations Uh, he talks about uh, what is known as the anthropological rationalism uh, he talks about uh, two concepts one is the fallibility of man and uh, second one the growing character of knowledge the basic problem of the classical rationalism in fact he talks about uh, 
the distinction between the classical rationalism and the modern uh, rationalism. And he says uh, the basic problem of the classical uh, rationalism is that uh, it did not take into account uh, the human presupposition of reason and consider it as a supreme rational unity. And similarly, he argued that uh, the classical empiricism also failed to note down the importance of the growing character of uh, human knowledge. And as a result, uh, that we are pushed into skepticism presenting the one dimensional view of uh, the individual and the world. This sentence is very important. Uh, for want of time, I am skipping this and uh, taking up the last one, the inclusive model. The inclusive model, remember, I said that there are four models and this is the fourth model or the fourth type of uh, philosophy that has been practiced by recent Indian philosophers. So this inclusive model, what is this inclusive model? Here I am going to discuss uh, two thinkers. The first thinker is Professor K. Chachidananda Murthy, uh, a well-known thinker. Uh, he uh, passed away uh, three or four years ago, one of the very important uh, philosophers of this country. Uh, he's a, a thinker who made a very significant contribution in um, uh, philosophy of uh, human being. And also he has uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, Asian philosophy, Asia-African philosophy. He, he taught philosophy more than... Uh, 35 years and he has lectured in several universities of both East and West and he is also the recipient of uh, uh, Dr. B.C. Roy National Award and also he received a Padma Bhushan Award from the President of India. He has written more than 25 books uh, and some of the books are very, very fascinating because he wrote on Far Eastern Philosophy, the Peace Studies, Indian Culture and Philosophy. And uh, one very, very important book, which all of us must read is Revelation and Reason in Advaita Vedanta. Revelation and Reason uh, in Advaita Vedanta, which is uh, very important for the main reason that uh, he could see Advaita from the Western standpoint also. Uh, he argues that there is a need for understanding the Western philosophy in order to understand Indian philosophy better. And so this is a message which is conveyed to us by Jain Mohanty also, because Mohanty also argues that Indian philosophers must read Western philosophy so that they can appreciate uh, the, uh, the values uh, which are hidden in Indian philosophy. And of course, uh, by saying that uh, Indian philosophers must read Western philosophy, he also says that Western philosophers must also read uh, Indian philosophy. Of course, this is not happening uh, frequently. Now, uh, I'll come back to K. Chachananda Murthy. Shortly, is known as Murthy. Uh, he talks, he, uh, for him, there are difficulties with regard to the concept of Maya and also of Brahman. Because uh, he has uh, severely uh, criticized the notion of uh, Maya uh, and argued that uh, there is a need to reinterpret some of the concepts. He asks this question. This question is uh, uh, worth considering. He says, how can Maya Avidya, which is beginningless, have an end? And the second question which he raises here is, by whom and how was it known that Avidya has an end? Also, he says that the doctrine of a non-dual Brahman is contradictory and so logically untenable and in as so much as no one convinced of its truth can teach us, no scriptures maintain it." Unquote. So Murthy's uh, uh, sorry, interdisciplinary approach to philosophical problem is always uh, fascinating. He is a philosopher of inclusiveness because of the reason that uh, he could uh, see different traditions coming and functioning under one roof. He says, uh, in fact, uh, he is not in favor of uh, the distinction between Indian and Western philosophy. Uh, he doesn't like uh, 
uh, the distinction which we are making the indian philosophy and western philosophy of course there was a big debate when he wrote uh, an article uh, on this topic he he raises this question very interesting question of course he says the term indian philosophy is itself uh, perplexing nobody he says very interesting he says nobody talks of indian physics indian astronomy or indian biology we have philosophy just as we have economics and geology all philosophy uh, people of the world have made contributions to these sciences this is his quotation of course now we are talking about indian uh, uh, astronomy indian biology and all that one so uh, how far this criticism is acceptable we have to see but uh, uh the idea of uh, criticizing this distinction between indian and western uh, has one particular uh, significant point what is that she says uh, when we make a distinction between indian philosophy and the western philosophy we must remember the fact that it is uh, the geography that uh, makes uh, a difference between indian and western for example we talk about uh, greek philosophy so this means it is a philosophy which has emerged in uh, that particular uh, region similar indian philosophy that so geographical uh, background is very important uh, while making the distinction between indian and western so uh, though he has criticized uh, this way of uh, uh, distinguishing between uh, uh, indian and western philosophy uh, has uh, some uh, good uh, salient features uh this uh, could be transcended this is what i feel now murthy has a very interesting book uh, entitled the philosophy in india uh, this is actually is a unesco project uh, some of our uh, faculty members uh, should have this book because this book uh, gives a uh, 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 entire picture of uh, philosophical uh, discussion or the courses or syllabus which are uh, done in different universities so this is nothing but uh, a country report uh, in this book uh, he argues that uh, there are three different conceptions of uh, philosophy prevailed in india at different periods what are they three different conceptions this is a very significant contribution the first uh, conception of philosophy is this philosophy as a rational critical and illuminating review of the content of theology economics and political science and also as a right instrument and foundation of all actions and duty which helps one to achieve the intellectual balance this he says is a anvikshi so this anvikshi is the method wherein we talk about uh, the rational critical and illuminating review of everything so this anvikshi uh, shiki is something which is very important uh, that philosophers must practice then second is philosophy as a system of ideas comprising epistemology metaphysics and ethics this he says is darshana and third according to him is philosophy as the intuitive network of views regarded man his nature and destiny and nature of the ultimate reality etc of these the second conception is found in sanskrit pali and prakrit sources and the third is expressed in other indian languages but uh, he says we should have all the three conceptions of philosophy he says it is a pity that in india <coughs> philosophy is approached from one conception and the other two are neglected so if you want to have a broad spectrum of uh, philosophical understanding then we must have all the three conception of philosophy so this uh, method of analysis is something very important in uh, the recent indian philosophy and i think this is a always a valid concept then i come to the last philosopher uh, who could be placed under uh, the inclusive uh, philosophy that is professor r balasubramanian uh, affectionately known as rb who lived between 1929 
to nine, uh, 2017. He's another important, uh, well-known philosopher in academic uh, field, both in India and outside. And uh, the uniqueness of uh, RB is that uh, you could combine both Indian and Western philosophy in his writing. And, uh, and as a result of that, one can say that it is a philosophy of inclusiveness. Borosubliberium has a, a broader perspective using the analytical because he is uh, well versed in uh, the analytical, the existential and the phenomenological method. Though he says uh, uh, he is uh, traditional Advaitin, Advaitin. So he says I will not deviate from my own tradition. But I like these methodologies and there is nothing wrong in applying the methodology uh, to uh, Advaita. So he says, a philosopher, I quote him, a philosopher enriches the tradition through analysis, explanation and interpretation of the old material so that one can see the world in the new light, unquote. He is a defender of tradition. There is no doubt about that. He has always believed that philosophy is not a an edifying discourse, but uh, a way of life. He has uh, uh, four category of writing uh, because uh, I have classified all his writing. The first category where we can see uh, the works like uh, uh, Nashkar of Sureshwara and others where he has been uh, giving a, a commentary note on these books. Then the second category of writing is uh, uh, where he talks about Advaita, uh, purely Advaita from the standpoint of uh, uh, classical Indian systems. Uh, and the third category of uh, philosophy uh, is from the Western understanding. This is uh, very important for me. In the third category of writings, he could uh, analyze Advaita hmm, from the Western mode of understanding. Uh, in fact, this is very much visible in all his uh, writings. Uh, uh, whenever he write on Advaita, uh, he could see that from the phenomenological, analytical and the existential standpoint. And the fourth category of writings uh, which belong to uh, 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 the contemporary uh, Indian philosophy. For example, he wrote on Gandhian thought uh, and also he edited uh, some works like uh, the free freedom, progress and society, etc. So what is important is that how he has used uh, the Western methodology to understand uh, Indian philosophy. And also, I was mentioning about, uh, while talking about uh, D.P. Chattopadhyaya, please remember, I have made a reference to the FISP volumes, P-H-I-S-P-C volumes. And uh, R.B. at the credit of uh, editing uh, more than five uh, FISP volumes. For example, uh, he edited a volume on Advaita Vedanta. They are not uh, very small volumes. Every volume runs into more than 900 to 1000 pages. So Advaita Vedanta, which was published in 2000, then Thesik Vedanta, another important value, volume, sorry, 2003. And also he has published, uh, uh, I mean, edited uh, uh, Life World of the Tamils, volume one and two. So he could uh, successfully show that how both uh, Indian and Western philosophy can travel together. Uh, in fact, uh, commenting on the role of philosophy or philosopher, he says uh, that uh, philosophy, which is uh, for the sake of people, has an important role to play in the society. Of course, one can talk about uh, liberation or one can talk, uh, talk about self, uh, jiva and all, oh, everything is important. But uh, philosophy, according to him, and I also endorse his view, philosophy must focus on the human being, man and his role in the society, how he could be uplifted, whether philosophy can do uh, some help uh, for a uh, human being. Otherwise, there is no, uh, there is no uh, need for doing philosophy. Balsupramanyam is uh, neither a traditionalist, a traditionalist nor uh, an Indologist. Is the one who tried to combine both an Indian Western tradition so that uh, one can uh, see the significance of uh, Indian tradition. And uh, his method uh, of approach 
is somewhat uh, similar to the Kyoto School established by Nishida and uh, Nistani, uh, who are keen on practicing philosophy with a loyalty to uh, its, our, its own tradition and at the same time openness to uh, the Western tradition. So the Kyoto School methodology was fully adopted by RB. That is, one must be loyal to, he would always say, uh, that one must be loyal to one's own tradition. At the same time, one should have the openness to receive some of the Western uh, concepts or philosophy which are available outside. So uh, this openness to the tradition and openness to the Western approach is something uh, very uh, important. Uh, that's why I would call him as uh, an inclusive philosopher. And uh, he is uh, a person who considers that the, the role of uh, the human being is to show a new direction for the younger generation. And uh, I'm, I'm closing in another few minutes. Uh, one of the unique features of RB's approach is that uh, if you read his writings, one can see the hermeneutic as well as uh, the phenomenology and existentialism, uh, which is seen through Vedantic eyes. This is very important. By using uh, Advaita as the backdrop, he could see uh, these uh, systems, uh, I mean, these uh, uh, movements, and uh, he could uh, adopt uh, some of the methods uh, which are available in the West. For example, he says uh, that Advaita Vedanta, he says is transcendental phenomenology, all right? The approach, uh, this approach of using the Western model has certain advantages. What advantage? The advantage, the major advantage is that uh, we can understand two different traditions and we can show how philosophy which emerges at, at different cultures could have some similarities with reference to with reference to some of the philosophical uh, ideas so when he says that uh, advaita is uh, nothing but transcendental phenomenology he is able to look at advaita from the uh, side of uh, Heidegger and Sartre and Husserl and argues, in fact, he, he, he goes a step further and argues that uh, Advaita, especially in Shankara's methodology, uh, the phenomenology is approached uh, in a better way. That's why he says it is, an, uh, it is not an ordinary phenomenology, uh, which is established by Heidegger, uh, Husserl and others. It is a transcendental phenomenology. Of course, this can be question in fact i one one of my uh, articles i have questioned this method so what but what is important is that uh, he is able to uh, look at uh, advaita from a new uh, perspective so one may not agree with this uh, new perspective but uh, the insights which are uh, available uh, is something which is remarkable also his reading of uh, the philosophical hermeneutics of uh, gadamer made him to rethink uh, some of the concepts like uh, tradition, historicity, and consciousness. So his love for Sartre, Heidegger, Husserl, Gadamer allowed him to apply the Western philosoph philosophical methods to Indian context. So he makes a very beautiful uh, remarks. He says, uh, uh, bracketing the theoretical assumptions, phenomenology gives a description of the experience of consciousness as it is lived and experienced. That is what uh, the Mandukya, Mandukya Upanishad does. The metaphysics of being, as formulated by Heidegger, brings out the limitation of uh, ontology, theology, and logic. The Heideggerian concept of uh, beyond ontotheology reinforces uh, the Advaitic concept of Nirguna Brahman. So it is through hermeneutics he wants to look at the Indian philosophical tradition and he tells us how to read uh, how to read uh, uh, the text uh, uh, using the method uh, which is available to us. In fact, uh, uh, his very, very important book uh, uh, is uh, The Seer and the Scene, which is uh, nothing but a project uh, volume, uh, which was published by the uh, Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, uh, which uh, wherein he talks about all the three methods, the phenomenological method, the existential method, and also the hermeneutical method. So he could uh, show that there, there is a need for us to understand uh, 
the western philosophy and there is a need for us to apply this uh, western method to indian philosophy so that uh, some can uh, some of us can uh, uh, understand the significance of uh, uh, indian philosophy because uh, uh, if if you if you simply stick on to tradition that's fine no doubt but it has got always a limitation which means you are you are you, you have a narrow way of understanding indian philosophy if you are openness if you are uh, open to the tradition then you can understand how tradition can be critiqued so there is a need for uh, the critique of tradition in the beginning itself i said that there is a need for the critique of tradition so he says the new is in the old and the old can sit comfortably with the new so he is the one who could uh, successfully combine the tradition and modernity so i have given four important uh, types or methods uh, which are available among the uh, among the recent indian philosophers and my purpose is to uh, uh, tell our young scholars especially some of our uh, seniors uh, know these thinkers very well but my idea is to tell our youngsters uh, that these are some of the philosophers uh, who lived with us or uh, who are with us and who has given a new methodology of indian philosophy so if we read these thinkers then your perspective of uh, indian philosophy will change and i feel that there is a need uh, for us to change our perspective towards indian philosophy indian philosophy has a very rich tradition Pro we can understand the significance of it provided if you are very open and uh, if you could transcend your uh, narrow approach then you can understand the role of uh, indian philosophy. thank you very much i am very grateful to the department for giving me this opportunity to give my talk i i don't know how far i am clear and all that one but i tried my best thank you very much thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir thank thank you so much uh, professor panish sir and sir it was really wonderful listening to you sir it was an excellent exposition of the subject um Uh, actually, uh, uh, the subject matter that is the recent uh, Indian Abhi philosophers, the contributions of Indian philosophers are uh, not much documented. Uh, not much documented, and I think like uh, this lecture will be a pioneering stone where right. the uh, recent uh, 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 Indian philosophers' contributions are uh, documented. I think our previous uh, lecture by you uh, in the ICPR periodical lecture. Uh, where we had uh, discussed about uh, uh, mohanti yes. and uh, uh, daya krishna so this will continue i think and we'll have uh, uh, more contributions from you and i would like to add one uh, particular point in this occasion uh, sir has uh, beautifully analyzed the uh, re recent indian philosophers into four category and the fourth category that is uh, inclusive philosophers and uh, uh, professor pani selvan sir well fits into that particular camp Uh, he is humble enough to uh, uh, know quote his own name but uh, of course his name is one of the important philosophers uh, which which contributed uh, uh, in the fourth camp uh, his uh, thesis itself uh, uh, which have uh, uh, a study of uh, uh, parallels finding parallels between wittgenstein and shankara has contributed immensely and i think he will continue to do so uh now thank you so much sir and we will have we'll take uh, two three questions or responses uh, from the audience yes. if anybody wants to ask question or uh, would like to respond to sir uh, please you can straightly switch on your mic and directly ask questions to sir Dr. Badri, you would like to sir, comment? Sir, one thing, uh, oh, oh, oh. sir, thank you for your wonderful sir. lecture, sir. You are no, you have always been a great friend to the Department of Philosophy, and we are very thankful for that. Sir, one thing which I just wanted to uh, ask you and uh, enlighten myself is: uh, Has anybody written about the ethics of contemporary uh, Indian philosophy, or have they analyzed that, sir, that part? And that is my question, sir. Thank you. yeah actually 
प्रोफेसर राजेंद्र प्रसाद प्रोफेसर राजेंद्र प्रसाद भूम आई जस्ट नाउ मेंशन हैज रिटर्न एक्सटेंसिवली ऑन एथिक्स कंटेम्प्ररी एथिक्स एंड ही हैज एडिटेड सम वॉल्यूम्स आल्सो एंड ऑफ कोर्स देयर आर मेनी थिंकर्स हु हैव डेल्ट विद एथिक्स बट व्हाट these uh, thinkers have done is that they were trying to reinterpret for example the concept of uh, varnashrama uh, which is uh, widely discussed in classical indian philosophy now rajendra prasad sir uh, what he did was uh, he tried to give uh, a reinterpretation of this uh, varnashrama uh, and similarly the concept of karma so uh, reinterpretation has been attempted by many of our uh, uh thinkers but uh, in classical see i will tell you the main distinction between indian and western philosophy is that in uh, western uh, uh, philosophical discourse we have got separate discipline for example we have ethics we have psychology we have aesthetics and all that one uh, but uh, in indian philosophy every system contains for example if we take uh, advaita or if we take uh, vishishta advaita or in sankhya nyaya in each and every system you see psychology you see ethics uh you see uh, um, epistemology you see logic so all it is it is a type of uh, inclusive philosophy so in classical indian philosophy this has been uh, very much familiar but many of our contemporaries uh, now have made an attempt to re understand for example the concept of karma has been reinterpreted for example i also reinterpreted the concept of karma in the context of social justice so this is how we can show the relevance of uh, the, the ancient concept but there is a need for reinterpret so in ethics uh, that's what many contemporary thinkers do one good example is a living philosopher who is uh, sir, once again sir my principal wants to just speak a few words sir hello sir sir dr panisam sir thank you sir namaste thank you, sir. sir thank you very much sir uh, it's thank you sir pleasure nice to see you it's a, it's a pleasure that uh, you are always available for jain college and the philosophy department next time we are blessed next time around i think uh, we should be having this program offline in the campus so that uh, i will get to see you personally thank you yes, so sir. much sir thank you sir thank you so much sir for your kind presence Thank you, sir. Thank you, you so, so much. You are so kind enough to participate in spite of all your busy work. No, sir, there, no? nothing at all. Sir, nothing at all. Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Amongst you, sir. Thank you, Mani Gandan, sir. Uh, Sumitra, madam, and Prasanna, sir. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Good morning. सर इंद्रा मैम सर 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 यू हैव एक्सप्लेन्ड इट वेरी वेल बट आई जॉइन्ड इन 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 बिटवीन द सेमिनार बट आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन सर आई वुड लाइक नो कैन यू सजेस्ट सम कंटेम्पररी तमिल फिलॉसफी कंटेम्पररी तमिल फिलॉसफर्स एक्चुअली कंटेम्पररी तमिल फिलॉसफी यानी इमीडिएटली சொல்ல வரல பட் இப்படி சொல்லலாம் ஏற்கனவே வந்து தமிழர் தத்துவம் சொல்லி ஏற்கனவே ஒரு ஒரு லெங்கி லெக்சர் கொடுத்துருக்கேன் அதில் என்னன்னா நம்ம வந்து இப்போ தமிழ் ஃபிலாசபின்னு சொல்லும்போது தமிழ் கண்டெம்பரரி தமிழ் திங்கர் சொல்லும்போது முழுக்க முழுக்க தத்துவத்தை தத்துவம் என்பது தமிழர் தத்துவம்னு சொல்லும்போது அது வந்து அதுக்கு ஒரு ஒரு பெரிய ஒரு வரலாறு இருக்குது அது இப்போ பார்த்தீங்கன்னா இங்கே தொல்காப்பியர் காலத்திலிருந்து நம்முடைய கலை கலாச்சாரம் பண்பாடு மரபு இவை எல்லாம் இணைந்ததுதான் தமிழருடைய தத்துவம் எனவே இப்ப நீங்க எதை பார்க்கலாம் என்றால் அதுல வந்து தமிழத்தினுடைய ஒரு கண்டெம்பரரி சமகாலத்திய தத்துவ தமிழ் தத்துவ அறிஞர்னு ஒரு ஆளை மென்ஷன் பண்றதுக்கு பதிலா நான் சொல்லுவேன் இந்த அயோத்திதாசர் போன்றவர்களும் தந்தை பெரியார் போன்றவர்களும் அதாவது நம்ம நமக்கு வந்து முழுக்க முழுக்க அது வந்து இதுலயே இருக்கு என்னது கதை சிறுகதை ஜெயகாந்தனுடைய கதைகளிலும் கவிதைகளிலும் நான் முத்துக்குமாரனுடைய கவிதைகள் எல்லாவற்றிலுமே பறந்து இருக்கிறது அதனால ஒரு ஆள் சொல்லி ஜெயமோகனுடைய கதைகள் எல்லாவற்றிலுமே பாத்தீங்கன்னா ஒரு ஒரு தத்துவம் இழையோடி கொண்டிருக்கும் 
அது அதுல இருந்து நாம் எடுக்க வேண்டியதுதான் தமிழருடைய தத்துவம் என்று நான் நினைக்கின்றேன் இது இது ஒருத்தருடைய புத்தகத்தோட முடிஞ்சு போயில பட் குறிப்பிட்டு சொல்ல வேண்டுமானால் ஆனா அயோத்திதாசனுடைய சிந்தனையிலும் தமிழர் தந்தை பெரியாருடைய சமகாலத்துவ அந்த தத்துவ விளக்கங்களும் இது நமக்கு வந்து நிறையவே நமக்கு வந்து தத்துவ கோட்பாடுகளை அளிக்கிறது என்று நான் நம்புகின்றேன் உடனே எனக்கு சொல்ல வரல பட் வந்து இது நான் தத்துவத்தை அப்படிதான் பாக்குறேன் தத்துவம் என்பது வெறுமனே ஒரு புத்தகம் இப்போ வெட்கன்சன் எடுத்துக்கொண்டால் பிலசாபிக்கல் இன்வெஸ்டிகேஷன் டிராக்டர்ஸ் எழுதிட்டாரு அதுல இருந்து நம்ம எடுத்துக்கலாம் பட் தமிழர் தத்துவத்தை நீங்க அது மாதிரி ஒரு புத்தகத்திலவோ இதுல தமிழர் தத்துவம் முடிஞ்சு போச்சுன்னு சொல்ல முடியாது ஜெயகாந்த எழுத்துக்கள் இருக்கு ரியலிசம் அதுல பாத்தீங்கன்னா அதுல இருக்குது அந்த மாதிரி சர் ரியலிசம் பாத்தீங்கன்னா அதோட எழுத்துக்கள் இருக்கிறது மௌனியுடைய கதைகளை பார்த்தா எக்ஸிஸ்டன்சிசம் இருக்கிறது அப்படி எல்லாவற்றிலும் சினிமாக்கள் கூட சினிமாவில் கூட நம்மளால வந்து தத்துவத்தை அடையாளம் கண்டு கொள்ள முடியும் உதாரணமாக சொல்ல வேண்டும் தான் பரியேறும் பெருமாள் அதை பத்தி நான் பேச ஆரம்பிச்சுன்னா நிறைய பேசிடுவோம் அதனால நிறுத்திக்கிறேன் திரைப்படங்களிலும் நம்முடைய வாழ்க்கையோடும் கதையிலும் கவிதைகளும் அது நாம் சொல்லுகின்ற அந்த நம்ம சிறு குழந்தைகளுக்கு சொல்லுகின்ற அந்த நீதி கதைகளிலும் கூட தத்துவங்கள் அடைங்குது அதனால் தத்துவத்தை எல்லா இடத்துலேருந்தும் எடுக்கணும் தேங்க்யூ Yeah. <laughs> because we are applying indian philosophical to understand indian philosophy we are trying to apply the western models where the, the western model becomes more predominant and indian philosophy becomes reduced and the mari or does it illa na what i uh, was trying to say is okay sir that by using the western methodology i am not reducing indian philosophy okay sir it is not reduced how i said i remember while using the methodology i am enriching my tradition i am telling you how my tradition that is our tradition our indian tradition is very important because it is by comparing or by analyzing or by showing the some parallels you can understand your culture or your values in a better way otherwise no it is like a frog in the well but now you have got a wider perspective that's why uh, if you see some of the methods which we apply to indian tradition we can understand that how the western methodologies have their own limitation it is not i am uh, it is not the case that i am saying that we have to simply adopt it and apply it and say oh this is fine no i am telling that uh, they too have the limitation that's what uh, professor rb did for example he said it has got a limitation but we have transcended that but i i, I have some difficulty in uh, saying that we have transcended everything because you no know, then we try to say that we are all perfect no what i am trying to say is that by applying that method you can show we can enrich your tradition you can show how beautiful is your tradition and all that one but western methodology is not all perfect i don't agree that they have given everything no they have their own limitation and similarly we have to admit the fact that we too have our own limitation but this is another methodology another tool i am okay. not able to see for example i am more than 60 i am not able to see everything properly so i am using the specs that's all it is a tool for me right fantastic this is a, by using this tool i can see you in a better way that's all so i am i am not saying that everything is perfect in the western methodology uh, they have got their own limitation but at the same time we have to be very careful in simply you know rejoicing that uh, indian philosophy is all perfect and everything it is perfect no doubt but at the same time wherever necessary we must be ready to change or adopt some changes in the methodology of indian philosophy. this is what uh, i am trying to do i may be a failure yes sir as you told the, the western model of gadamer where he emphasizes on tradition is so wonderful 
when you come back to the indian tradition where he places tradition and uh, role of uh, understanding how tradition sh- shapes one's understanding is absolutely correct sir but yeah, yeah. can't we not understand indian philosophy from another indian philosophical point of view sir we have to have uh, yeah. To- yeah yeah that's a, it's a very good question in fact uh, we have to go only indian philosophy to understand western there is there not any other indian philosophical method of understanding very good, very, very, it's a very, very 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 important question i'm happy that you have raised this question this question uh, was raised to me some time back also they say why you are using western methodology why can't you use some other indian philosophy indian philosophical method i say that this is a method which is familiar to me i know western tradition so i am using that if you know indian tradition some other methodology you apply i am not preventing you but i i i don't have a method that's all that is but uh, every 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 system of philosophy in india has its own methodology for example if you look at puro mimamsa then you can see how hermeneutics has been playing important role yes yes so nyaya logic so every uh, tradition or every particular system of thought has a particular methodology so there is nothing uh, you are right uh, there is nothing wrong in applying the indian methods to indian systems it's perfectly all right but this is convenient to me and this is the only method known to me so i am doing that that's all absolutely sir there are so, so many perfect method there are so many parallels between indian philosophy and western philosophy so the many meaning and the spot yeah. uh, meaning language and all is spread by yeah. analyzed in mimamsa same in by the philosophical remnants of gadamar etc thank you sir thank you very much sir i am not uh, i want to also say that i am not uh, come here to celebrate western philosophy no that is not my aim my aim is to celebrate indian philosophy right but at the same you. time i am not simply saying oh everything is perfect in indian philosophy there is there is, a, there is a, if there is a need we'll interpret and reinterpret so that uh, the beauty of indian philosophy can be uh, known to everyone that's all thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you sir i think uh, we have one question in the yeah, yeah i'm box, sorry sir. i'm sorry i have taken more time as you said uh, it's my basic problem there is one question in the chat box sir like uh, shall i read it for you yeah yeah please if you could read it i'll be grateful uh this is from uh, one mr praveen uh, he w- would like to know uh, is there any book there where we can understand uh, uh, the recent uh, indian philosophy no. i think <laughs> unfortunately unfortunately there is no one philosophy book uh, which can give us a um uh, 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 a discourse on recent indian philosophy in fact uh, this is my project uh, uh, when when i was given a national fellowship by the icpr i i have this project but uh, i am planning to write uh, an extensive book uh, on this but uh, i don't know uh, but there is no one book so what you have to do is you have to read the writings of each thinker and i have mentioned only few there are other thinkers whom i have not mentioned in because what i want to like ss barlinge and many others suraj chandra and many others and my 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 uh, primary objective is to show some throw, throw some light uh, on these thinkers so that uh, we'll at least remember the names of these thinkers because they have made a very significant significant contribution of course classical indian philosophy is something remarkable i am not denying that but let us read our own thinkers also this is my humble request to all of you thank you so much sir and uh, we'll be uh, eagerly waiting for the book what you what you are uh, proposed to write thank you thank you, thank you sir i think uh, uh, we are uh, running short of schedule and i if i i i, I think I'm, i'm sure that there are many questions but i think uh, uh, the uh, time is running so uh, i'll request uh, our uh, hod uh, as many content sir to say a few words and introduce the next speaker over to you sir thank you prasanna thank you, thank, you, thank you panit sir and it was an excellent lecture and uh, we are always grateful indebted to you whenever a call from a department of philosophy from agachan manmohan jain college we are ready to help us thank you sir expecting the same support and encouragement in coming years also sir thank you sir thank you thank sir. you thank you professor manigandan thank you sir thank, thank you, you so much sir
thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you Panir Sarwan sir, thank you. Unni Krishan. Ah, Unni Krishan. How are you? I am not able to see you. Where are you? Yeah. Now you are visible. I see. I am eagerly waiting for your lecture. Please. Thank you, Panir Sarwan ji. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have inspired me to think in the lines of philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vyas ji.